Well, I was saying that the sabiti are simply a pejorative picture of the other seven survivors of the flood. And why so pejorative? Why so malevolent? It's obvious that when the rebellion against Noah occurred as, as a result of the curse on Canaan, even though it was triggered by Ham, the, the ideology of the, of the Hellenes shows you what happened. The, the concept of the Olympians versus the Titans. The Titans were the sons of, uh, the, the Titans were the immediate sons of Ham. That is, they were in a certain generation. The Olympians come in the next generation. And so the, the basic ideology surrounding the Mesopotamian mythological handling and the Greek handling and the Hindu handling, uh, especially the Greek and the, and the Mesopotamian, the ideology was to pejorate the further back you go. You want, you want to suppress Noah. You get The whole purpose of pagan mythology is to trample on Noah's face. That's the purpose of it. And you damn him with faint praise as Utanapishtim. You, you've got to get rid of the monogenetic origin. You've got to get rid of, of the hierarchical conception of the descent of the gods from a family of eight people. So what do you do? In the Egyptian tradition, the Marduk epic, you treat the eight survivors of the flood in a quaint way that is no longer that, that is not yet completely pejorative because you're dealing with them at a time when they're the common origin and you can't be trampling on them there. But then, in the, in the poem of Era, you've got Anu, that is Noah, in an alienated position. You know he's alienated because he's no longer a member of the eight. The eight has been broken down, in other words. Why is Anu separate from the Sabiti? The reason he is is because of the death of Apsu. Noah has been cut off, cut out, Something happened. I don't know what it was. Sidon did something in killing Apsu, which is to say in destroying the original relationship of Noah politically to the other eight survivors of the flood and to the remainder of the early post diluvian community. So when you have Anu as Anum, as a figure separate from the Sabiti, creating the Sabiti, this is a rehearsal of the fact that Noah was the creator of the eightfold family that survived the flood but he's treated as separate from them, and he's pictured as sending them into the world to wreak havoc. That is to be, you know, that's, that's the, the text of the poem of Era. Uh, Anu addresses the Sabidi and says, go out and terrorize man, burn everything up, turn into serpent venom and poison everybody. Why are they doing it? It's obvious. This is the official left-wing rebel line, the line of Canaan and Sidon and the rest of them, propagandizing against the alienated figure of Noah, acknowledging in that case that Noah is the heaven prince, but sending, but identifying the other seven survivors of the flood as malevolent figures in the same way that the Hellenic tradition identifies the earlier generation of the Titans as malevolent figures. See, what I'm saying is that the, the Sabiti are exactly analogous to the Titans. They're not the same because the Titans are in the first generation of Ham. In the, in the case of the Sabiti, this, this is the first generation of Noah. Uh, and, and not just that, but I mean the, the Diluvian family. So in other words, the Sabiti are an alienated picture of the eight survivors of the flood. Why more alienated than the Marduk epic? Because the Marduk epic is referring to the eightfold family of Noah when both factions were, were, were resident in them. That is, before the factional strife began, they're, they were the common ancestors of both the left-wing uh, uh, ideologues of Mesopotamia and also the loyalist faction. But when you get down into the context of the, of the poem of Era, the damage has already been done, Apsu has already been killed, and therefore the entire body of the eight survivors of the flood are in a state of alienation from whom? People like Sidon, people like Sheila, people like Marduk. So there's a conflict going on, and you see that conflict confirmed by the tradition of the Sabiti. The Sabiti are an alienated version of, this, of seven of the eight survivors of the flood. And if you add Anum, who, who uh, gives birth to them and instructs them to go terrorize mankind or to terrorize whoever they're going to terrorize, this is simply the official Mesopotamian line of saying that the loyalists, the family of Noah, who saw what Canaan had done and saw what Sidon was doing and saw who, what Sheila was doing, formed a, an old fogey, generation gap, angry sect who all joined for a while. Maybe even Ham himself turned against his son Canaan. I don't know the extent to which he might have done that. I, see, I tend to see the eight survivors of the flood as regenerated figures, spiritually regenerated, and that despite the evil that came from Ham. In other words, these are holy figures. 
This is something I owe to John Whitcomb, where he talks about the fact that the animals were subdued because essentially the family of Noah were a covenant community. They were holy. In other words, the family of Noah surviving the flood was something like the returning saints to the millennial earth. And then the sinners will be among people who haven't been transformed yet in the millennial age, and that would be analogous to these, these younger, rebellious generations. So even though Ham contributed a lot to the rebellion, he, his sense of solidarity with the Diluvian family was probably such that he could be included in the Sabiti, and that from the fall of Noah forward, that is the death of Apsu forward, the Sabiti were in alliance with Anu, and they were, uh, despite the sympathy they might have for someone like Shelah or for someone like uh, the rest of them, uh, they basically became enemies of Babylon, enemies of the Mesopotamian order, and enemies of the Mesopotamian version of mankind. Hence the picture of the Sabiti. So many things are added. It, it's the, uh, the poem of Era as a whole is the Mesopotamian attestation to the first Kish era and to its great prince Peleg. Furthermore, the poem confirms Peleg's alliance with Heth, son of Canaan, which helps to explain the later ethnography of the Phrygians and the Hittites, the fact that both were Indo-European speakers, by the way. The, the uh, Anatolian Hittites were exotic Indo-Europeans, and the Phrygians were exotic Indo-Europeans, that is, the Trojans. And so it would help explain that faction. It confirms the, the Heth-Peleg alliance in forming the First Kish Order. It confirms the identity of Sheila Marduk, not only as the victor of the later Eric Arata scene, but as, as synonymous with the, with the fading glory of the Tower of Babel era. It doesn't describe the Tower of Babel. It only treats Marduk's glory as something that's fading away in the 180th year, and that confirms Sheila's identification with his uh, uh, relatives, Nimrod and the others, who were the Tower of Babel builders. You see, So Sheila Marduk is at the center of the Tower of Babel episode and in that cause, and his glory is fading after the Tower of Babel era. And then again, it confirms the concept that the entire Diluvian family became alienated from the younger generations, from this great faction formed by Sidon and by uh, Sheila and the others, in the image of the alienated, enraged Sibiti and their creator Anu. This is simply the Diluvian family in its alienated state. Now, you might ask a question chronologically, where does that alienation take place? Well, that brings you to another detail of the poem of Aaron. I haven't even read it. All, I haven't read it all yet. I haven't studied all of it yet. But you can see another detail. Anum turns to Era, who is Peleg, and turns the Sabiti over to him for his use. Now that's very. There you have a direct attestation of the fact that Peleg was at one time the supreme royalist of all the younger princes, of all the members of the later generations, he was the one who was most characteristic of the old cause of Shem and Noah. Despite the fact that he was a grandson of Shelah, he turned against his grandfather and turned toward his great-great-grandfather, or whatever. That is Shem and Noah and that particular loyalist group. So Peleg was an arch-loyalist, and he came to power from the 180th year to the 210th precisely because he was in alliance with whom? The Sabiti and with Anu, that is with Noah and the Diluvians who survived the flood and who were alienated from this younger generation Olympian business of the family of Canaan. So many points uh, have been added. They're just all corroborative. Uh, the event, the central event, is the reign of Peleg from the 180th to the, to the 210th year. Uh, you confirm that Sheila Marduk, his grandfather, was a leader of the Tower of Babel order in the previous 30 years. And that is all before the great victory of Marduk over Peleg himself in, in, the, in what amounts to the Tiamat faction of the next 30 years after the lapse of Peleg's power in the 210th year. You show again that Peleg was an arch-loyalist because Noah Anum hands over the Sabiti to his use, and that means that Noah simply gave the moral sanction of the Diluvian family to Prince Peleg, something that I've always believed. I've always believed that. Now, what Peleg did with that during the 30 years of his reign, and what he did with that Noahic heritage after the end of his reign in the Eric Arata War period, that's another matter. But there has never been any question in my mind that Peleg was the figure uh, selected by the loyalist Noahic faction as, a, as an adversary to the uh, Canaan faction. Of course, I, I originally developed that concept simply because I knew that Peleg was Nergal. I knew that he was Era, 
and I knew that he was pictured as the enemy of Babylon, and that meant the enemy of the Mesopotamian establishment, which is the uh, core of the preternatural world system, simply because uh, they, they uh, took their descent spiritually. The Mesopotamians took their descent spiritually from the faction that worked against Noah from the event of Genesis 9, 26 and following. It all is very, very clear to me. I suppose I could lay it out in a more pedagogical way, but it's all very, very clear. The poem of Era complements the Marduk epic chronologically and logically and politically. It fills in what I already knew to be there. It's a powerful corroboration. The next step in side B of this tape on the poem of Era is to consider a rather radical hypothesis based on, again, putting the poem of Era side by side with the Marduk epic and focusing on the fact that I allege that Noah appears under two different identities in those two poems. He appears clearly, in my mind, as the Apsu figure, the paternal watery abyss figure, Apsu, Abzu, of the Marduk epic. Whereas in the poem of Era, with a different political focus on the rise of Peleg between the 180th and the 210th year, Noah appears as Anu, Anu, the heaven principle. Now my original conception, my original Genesis 10 conception, was that Noah, as founding father of the Noahic family, had the privilege of establishing the first linguistic stock formally in the first 30-year period after the flood. And I always identified that race as the Uralo Altaics, the people of the heavenhood, the people of An, the people of Anu, the people of the persona, the, the version of God known to the Hebrews as El Elyon. And then that carries down to Melchizedek and so forth. That's how I always conceived it. Now I'm ready to consider a somewhat different hypothesis concerning Noah's role on the basis of noting that in the context of the first 77 lines of the Marduk epic, which is the primitive period before the curse on Canaan leading up to it, he's associated with the water. Now I used to regard that just as a propagandistic calumny. I used to think that the, the fact that Noah was not called An or not called Anu was a lie. It, was, it wasn't true. Uh, but now that I see Noah emerging in this other equally propagandistic, equally pagan poem, the poem of Era, as Anu, this is beginning to reshape my thinking about the actual role played by Noah uh, politically and in terms of forming these different nation, nations, complementing the other survivors of the flood in forming a nation of his own. Now here's what's happening. You, I've always faced the mystery. What did Sidon, Enki, Ea Nudamud do to avenge his father, avenge the curse that had been placed on his father by Noah, in killing the Apsu figure, taking his tiara, taking away his power? What had he done? What did he do? What did he accomplish? And you have what looks like an ironic situation in that uh, Noah has been presented as Apsu, presumably a lesser god, the water principle, in the Marduk context before his downfall, and then he turns up as the An, the heaven principle, the, the, uh, the Anum of the poem of Era in relation to a later stage of early post diluvian history. What's going on there? The suggestion is this, that the original stock formed by Noah in the first 30 years after the flood was not the Uralo Altaic, that the Uralo Altaic was formed later and under a different sanction and in a period much closer to the similar Sino-Tibetan. The Sino-Tibetan are the Chinese, the uralo Altaics, the Koreans, and the Mongols, and that the uralo Altaic people were not the first stock, but that the first stock was the people of the waterhood. So in effect, the, in the sequence of forming these different stocks to the names of God, the first principle was not the El Elyon principle, but the El Olam principle, of the, the principle of eternity, and associated with the image of water. In other words, what happened at the curse was that the musical chairs process that I've traced in relation to Ham and Japheth and Shem also applied to Noah. And perhaps it was the application of this musical chairs principle to Noah that constitutes the great coup, 
that the rebels made in avenging the curse on their father, uh, that is, on Sidon's father, uh, uh, Noah. In other words, if the waterhood of El Olam, if, the, if it's the waterhood given in effect to the Apsu figure, to Noah, was in fact the first principle at the cornerstone of the early post diluvian heritage, then uh, the fact that Noah later appears as An or Anum is a demotion. And he lost control over the first stock. And the question is, what is the first stock? And there's no question at all as to the water stock. The stock of the heaven principle is clearly the Aralo Altaic. The stock of the water principle that's eventually associated with Sidon himself, Ea, Enki, Nudabud, is the Sumerian race. And so the conclusion to be drawn from this is that the Sumerian race was in fact the elder race, the oldest race of all, and that would explain why the Sumerians become the host of world civilization after the flood. They were stock number one. Now, you say, does this distort my view of the racial character of Noah? Absolutely not. I believe that Noah was mongoloid, but the fact is that I've already traced the Sumerians straight to Noah. Genetically, physically, not linguistically, see? That's the point. I've already traced the Sumerian race to Noah's physical genetic source, because I, I believe this. Noah's royal wife was the red matriarch, but he had mated with the white matriarch before the flood and begat two sons by the white matriarch, Shem and Japheth. After the flood, and this is the detail in the Genesis 10 book, he and the white matriarch again gave birth to a post diluvian son who would be a full brother to Japheth and Shem. I believe that this figure was named Dumuzi by the uh, Sumerians and that he was the proper patriarch of the Sumerian race. He was a son of Noah and the white matriarch. And the Sumerian race were a round-headed white stock. They would get their white identity from their mother, and they would get their round-headed uh, trait, which is a quasi-mongoloid trait, from their father. And therefore, the Sumerian race were the first stock. And therefore, what happened in Nuremun's vengeance against Apsu in destroying Noah was to take away from Noah control over whom? The Sumerian race. That's the answer. So when I say in the Genesis 10 book that Noah was the founder of the Aralo Altaics, that in a sense is right, but the way I present it is wrong. Because I claim that he created the Aralo Altaic stock from the very beginning in the first 30 years after the flood, and he didn't. What he did was to create the Sumerian stock, and the Sumerian stock was stock number one, and it was the stock sacred to the water principle, which in the Hebrew theology uh, is, the, is the divine name El Olam that appears only once, I think. It's, just a, it's a very obscure name, and one of the reasons is that the Sumerian race became so completely alienated uh, and so completely paganized under the influence of the Canaanite faction. So the reason why you get Noah as Apsu in the Marduk epic in the first 77 lines is that that was exactly what he was. He wasn't the representative of the Anhood of the Aralo Altaics, he was a representative of the waterhood of the Sumerians, so that the Sumerian people were the first nation formed after the flood. And then that musical chair is processed. Noah loses the Sumerians and takes over the Aralo Altaics. And as a matter of fact, the Sumerians, the Finno Ugrians, and the Aralo Altaics all are akin to each other linguistically. They certainly have more in common than they have with the, with the Indo Europeans and the Semites, the two stocks associated with Shem eventually. So they're very different uh, linguistically, and they sort of belong together, the Sumerians, the Finno-Ugrians, and the, and the Aralo Altaics. Just how much affinity exists there, I don't know, but that, clearly that's the closest pattern of association. So stock number one created by Noah was in fact the Sumerian stock, not the Aralo Altaic stock. Now that raises a further issue, and a fascinating one to me, of where the heavenhood originally resided among the eight, because see, the eight survives of the flood. Are the are correlate with these eight divine personae of God, the, 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 these various names. And the original representative of the Enlil ship in the pagan language, or the divine name Elohim, was Ham. That's the Semitic stock, and then it carries over to Shem. So the people of Elohim, the Shem, the people of Enlil, as, so to speak, uh, reverts over from the, from the Ham uh, Canaan faction over to Shem. Shem tries to claim what we call the Semites, and does through the curse of Noah. But, and then, uh, again, Japheth established what we know as the Egyptian people, the Hamites, but they're known as Hamites because in this musical chairs process that struck like lightning 90 years after the flood, a Japheth stock was handed over to Ham to compensate him. So there's a complete revolution. It's just that I hadn't pushed the revolution far enough 
I hadn't taken at face value the fact that Noah was Apsu. He was a representative of the water principle. In other words, he was the original Enki. He was the original Ea, as a matter of fact. But he's, he's uh, presented as Apsu. The main, that's a way of representing that abortive waterhood. So the Sumerian stock were his original people, just as the Egyptians were Japheth's original people, and just as the Indo-Europeans were Shem's original people, and just as the Hamites were Ham, excuse me, the Semites were Ham's original people, but they didn't wind up that way. Eventually, the Egyptians wind up under Ham, the uh, Semites wind up under Shem, and the Sumerians wind up under uh, Sidon Enki, that is, a son of Canaan, but they had originated from Noah. Now that raises the issue, if that's the case, where did the original impetus behind the Aralo Altaic stock come from? Who were the people of the Aralo Altaic stock, who are a predominantly Mongoloid people? That's one reason why I always thought that they came from Noah, because I'm, I'm still convinced that Noah was a Mongoloid character. He had a, he had a yellow polarity. Uh, that's not as clear-cut as, the, as the, uh, the pattern of the yellow matriarch, who is absolutely representative of that stock, but I still believe that that's the Sethite stock, and Noah came in the male line out of the Sethite stock, Seth was the first Mongoloid Asian man, the first yellow man, son of Adam. And uh, therefore, uh, the, the issue is, where did the heaven stock come from? And that's a fascinating issue. Where is the heavenhood located? One, uh, one clue that's very obvious is that this Ishtar Esther Inanna figure is the queen of heaven. And she's the one who's the mother of the Marduk figure, the daughter of Arpachshad one son of Shem. So who was the early post-Alluvian, originally connected with the heavenhood. Now, to answer this question as to where the Anship resided in the Diluvian family itself, if it did not reside in Noah, because Noah had instead the Enki ship, the waterhood, as the establisher of the Sumerian race. Where was the Anship? There are two clues in the first 77 lines again of the Marduk epic. The first clue is that the, the all eight survivors of the flood are represented in that part of the Marduk epic except one person. And that one person is the yellow matriarch, the wife of Shem, the Sethite woman who became Shem's wife and the mother of our Foxed one born two years after the flood. She disappears. She's not there. Now, eventually, I associate her with the Nana hood, the lunar principle of the Sino-Tibetan stock. And that may be what she eventually participated in after these events of the 90th year. But the fact that she's missing, and she's not even present, combined with one other clue, and that is that the name Anu is given to one of the, one of the sons of, uh, one of the members of the Hamite family, is given to Canaan. Because it's very clear that Ham, uh, Ham, uh, Anshar and Kishar are Ham and the white matriarch. Their son is called Anu, and that's clearly Canaan, father of Nudamud, Enki, Ea, Husaidan. So the name is given to Canaan. Now, why would that be? Now, that doesn't solve our problem because Canaan was not a member of the Diluvian family. He's a post-Diluvian, born after the flood. So that doesn't solve the problem. But what I would, what I would hypothesize here is that the unship of the Uralo Altaic stock originally belonged to that Sethite woman. Instead of the Sethite man, Noah, it belonged to the Sethite woman, the yellow matriarch, the wife of Shem. And she fails to appear in the Marduk epic through the conceit that she doesn't have to be named because her unship was already handed down to a later patriarch, namely to Canaan. Now, how did Canaan, son of Ham and the white matriarch, wind up with the onship at that early stage? Well, it goes this way. The yellow matriarch and her husband, Shem, it gave birth to Arfox at one, and then they gave birth to this all-important female who is the link figure between the line of Shem and Ham, the mother of Marduk, the mother of Sheila, named in the Sumerian mythology as Inanna, the Queen of Heaven. Now, because she's called the Queen of Heaven, that would imply that the Anship was somehow passed from her, uh, her uh, grandmother, you see, Shem and the yellow matriarch, the yellow matriarch would be uh, owning the Anship, the right to represent El Elyon, An, Anu, the God of Heaven. And this, this name is passed down, uh, the pre, uh, you know, call her a priestess of, uh, of Anu, call her a priestess of, of El Elyon. She hands down this honor through her son, Arphoxid, 
to our Foxed's all-important daughter, Inanna, Ishtar Esther, the Queen of Heaven. And then this Queen of Heaven marries Sidon, son of Canaan, and gives birth to the all-important Marduk figure. Now, how in the world does Canaan acquire the onship? Well, apparently through the conceit of the early post diluvian community as revealed in the first 77 lines of the Marduk epic, when this woman, the queen of heaven, carrying the onship, married Sidon, she obviously became a daughter-in-law of Canaan. And apparently as his daughter-in-law, part of the marriage arrangement, I suppose, or some sort of a principle of marriage that applied at that time, was it because she became a wife of his son Sidon, his firstborn, somehow Canaan acquired the onship from her. So the onship went from the yellow matriarch, the Sethite woman who survived the flood, a kinswoman to Noah, and passed from her through Noah's son Shem, uh, that, that is, through, through uh, the marriage of Shem to the yellow matriarch, passed to Arphoxid one, and through Arphoxid one, passed to Arphoxid one's female heir, that is this very powerful Anana figure, she married Sidon, son of Canaan, and as a daughter-in-law to Canaan, she passed the onship to Canaan. And this may have been legitimate. I say it may be a propagandistic. I've always viewed the, the fact that Canaan appears in the Marduk epic as, uh, as propaganda, but maybe it was legitimate. Maybe Canaan uh, legitimately acquired the onship. And then, in this great revolution of the 90th year, through the sin of Ham and the and the uh, curse on Canaan, all of this thing. In other words, uh, when Canaan was cursed, this was a curse that applied to the Semitic stock that Ham was forming, and apparently it also applied to the onship that Canaan had, cl had claimed. And in the curse, the onship passed over from Canaan. The, the, the onship had passed down through this route that I've explained. It had passed over to Canaan through the marriage arrangement between our fox's daughter and Sidon, Canaan's son, and then it was simply passed over to Noah. And Noah absorbed the onship and lost the Anki ship. And there was some privilege associated with the Anki ship, aside from just establishing the Sumerian race, that was all important. You know, there's a lot of talk about giving the destinies to the gods. And it could very well be that the giving of the destinies or something had something to do with the privilege of El Olam, the god of eternity. And that the, the Anki ship or the waterhood of the Sumerian race and maybe it was simply the fact that the Sumerian race was race number one, rather than Uralo Altaic. So as a result of this comparison between the poem of Era and the poem of Marduk, and noting that Noah is called Anu, the heaven principle, in the poem of Era in reference to a later development, and that he's called Apsu, a water figure, uh, and he's also a water figure in Egyptian mythology, Noah is, what this suggests is that Noah originally had the water hood, he originally had the Enki ship of water and of the divine name El, El Olam, the God of Eternity. And that somehow that was the basis of his, of his authority. And at the time of the Great Revolution, the sin of Ham and the curse of Canaan, what happened was that Canaan uh, passed over the, the onship that had come from the yellow matriarch down to him and passed it over to Noah. And Noah lost his control over the Enki ship and over the Sumerian race, which is foundational race number one. And in that sense, Noah lost control over the earliest post-Diluvian stock, in other words, and the people who were destined to inherit Mesopotamia. The primary inheritors of Mesopotamia are the Sumerians, and then, of course, the Akkadian Semites come in after that. But uh, Noah no longer controls the Mesopotamian primary race, the Sumerian race, as he did in the beginning. And he did so through a son of his by the white matriarch, uh, a full brother to Shem and Japheth. And he lost that control, uh, a control that's indicated in my analysis of the Gundestrup cauldron, where the figure of Noah does, in fact, correspond geographically to the land of Sumer. I've, I've already saw that relationship, all the materials to make this step. So Noah was not primarily the creator of the Uralo Altaic stock. It was not, that wasn't the divine name. He wasn't the An. But he inherited the onship in the same way that his sons had this musical chairs revolution. And in gaining the onship, apparently he gained a lot. And then he passed it on to his son after his death, and, and uh, Shem emerges as Melchizedek, the priest of El Elyon, and that's the onship. So the what I've done here is to create a shakeup of progenitor relationships to different ethnic stocks. Out of the eight survives the flood, five remain the same. 
That is, Shem is the first Indo-European, Ham is the first Semite, Japheth is the first Hamite, uh, the, red, the black matriarch is the first Austronesian, the red matriarch is the first Amerindian. But the shakeup involves the other three, Noah and the white and the yellow matriarchs. The yellow matriarch emerges as the first Uralo-Altaic, not the first Sino-Tibetan. And her son, uh, Ashkenaz by Noah, is a reinforced Mongoloid, Sethite, and the Mongols and the Koreans are the most strongly marked of all the Mongoloid peoples. The Chinese, the, especially the Chinese people of the northern part of China, are fairer skinned than the other Chinese, but they're also less Mongoloid than the Mongols and the Koreans. And that is because the, and the reason the Chinese are less Mongoloid is that they owe their origin to the white matriarch, the Caucasoid matriarch. I should have recognized that because the white matriarch is Ningal, the wife of Nana, the lunar prince of Ur, the, the source of the Chinese people, the lunar race. Ningal is our foxed one's wife. The white matriarch is the wife of the Chinese progenitor. So there it all is. Foxed one himself is yellow, Mongoloid, but he, but as...